Father, we just thank you so much for loving us and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world for each and every one of us, Lord. Father, we thank you for showing up in our midst every Sunday. We thank you for being here. And we invite you into our hearts and we invite you into our, our spirit and Lord, I just ask you right now to just speak through me the words that you have given me and touch the lives and the hearts of folks that are listening. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been a minute since I've been up here, so y'all might have to, I, you know, I get a little nervous, so y'all have to forgive me. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> the few weeks ago when Al asked me to to speak this Sunday, it was about a month ago, I guess, I started thinking about what I might talk on, I, you know, praying about what I might bring as the message. And over the course of just praying about it and thinking about it, what kept coming up into my thoughts was how life is like a jigsaw puzzle. How our lives are so much, there are many, many puzzle pieces. And so that just kept coming up in, into my thought and in my spirit. And the more I prepared for speaking today, the more that I could see the comparison of our life in a jigsaw puzzle, which brought forth a memory that I'm going to share with you all. A few years ago, <coughs> Jacob pulled out this puzzle and uh, one of his sisters had left it there when they had moved. And, and he brings this puzzle over, and it's about a 1,000 or 1,200 piece puzzle. You jigsaw puzzlers, y'all know those are little bitty pieces. Well, <coughs> he brings this box over, and he's wanting to put this puzzle together. And I look at the box, and all I, first of all, the first thing I see is the 1,000, 1,200 piece puzzle. And I'm like, I'm out. And then I realize it's the map of the world. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? You want to put this map of the world together? And so I really wanted to talk him out of that particular puzzle. So we go back to the closet and we're looking at the other puzzles that we have in there. We have some puzzles that have 20, 30, 50, 100 pieces in there. And I try to direct him into some of those and he wasn't interested. He's clutching tightly to that box. And he was wanting put that puzzle together, he was very determined. And all I could think about and all I could focus on was literally the sea of blue. The entire blue background of this puzzle. And then I noticed that this puzzle had about a two and a half inch black frame around the entire map. So not only do I have all blue, I got all black that I got to worry about too and I got to figure out how, I'm like, yeah, that might happen. So, I was very frustrated and I just didn't want to do it. And I looked over at Jacob and, of course, he's still in that cute phase because he's still, you know, a little boy but not quite a big little boy. So, he's six and so <laughs> he's got a lot of those cute little features and that pull and tug at mama's little heartstrings and so... I look at him and he's got his big old brown eyes looking at me and he's holding on to this box, the biggest grin on his face and his whole face is lit up. And I'm like, all right, dude, let's put the world together. <laughs> and so we take it over to the table because I'm literally convinced that once we dump this 1200 piece puzzle out onto the table, that he will be so overwhelmed himself with the massiveness of this puzzle and this project that he'll just be over it and want to move on to something else. He is six after all. So we dump this puzzle out onto the table and of course all these itty bitty puzzle pieces are dancing all over the table and I'm trying to gather them all up and I noticed something that I had not realized. <coughs> Margo, Jacob's oldest sister, had already educated him and trained him on how to prepare for a puzzle of this magnitude. Here my six-year-old begins to separate all these puzzle pieces. He's turning them face up, 
and he's separating the solid blue into a pile. The blue parts has got land attached to it. Put it in another pile. And before we knew it, we had been working on this puzzle for quite a while. And I'm surprised, honestly, that we worked on it as long as we did. But as I expected, eventually his attention moved on to something else and he wanted to do something else. But now, he did not want to put this puzzle away. He just wanted to take a break. So, the puzzle stayed on our table. Days go by, and we play with it a few, to, you know, put pieces here and there. Weeks go by, and something interesting happened. As the puzzle stayed on our dining room table, when our friends and our family members and our church family would come by to visit and hang out, we'd find ourselves sitting there putting that puzzle together and they would shuffle the pieces around and they would add a piece here or there and they would enjoy in the excitement of sharing of putting this puzzle together with us. <clears throat> and each afternoon, Jacob would come home with anticipation from school to check out what had been added to the puzzle and how much had been added. And he would comment one day, or a couple of different times, about how important our friends and family are because they're helping us put this big, huge puzzle together. <clears throat> and before we knew it, the puzzle was almost done. And it was nearly finished. And then finally, one afternoon, the last piece of the puzzle, the final piece, goes into the puzzle. Jacob was so proud. He stood back and admired it. And he looked at the puzzle, hands on his hips. And he says, Well, we finished it, didn't we? But we didn't do it by ourselves, did we, Mama? At the time, I didn't realize what wise words those were coming from my six year old. As this memory came back into my mind, and I was thinking about how that puzzle is like, like your life, it was like a movie reel of my life. I could see it dropping from just space. And the pieces of my life were falling onto this canvas. <coughs> Some of the pieces would fall into the canvas and they fit just perfect. And then other pieces were out on the perimeter. And I could see them laying out there. And I'm like, what's that one over there for? Why does that one not fit over here? Where is that one going? And then I would see others. And I would think, I wonder where that one's going to go. I can't help but to wonder those things. At least I can anyway. I'm a wonder woman. I wonder about everything. But the one constant thing I noticed is this movie reel of my life and the puzzle pieces falling into place that was consistent was the relationships that were in my life. The relationship that I had with others and what they meant to me and how important they were. Some of those relationships I still have. Some of them were only for a season and for a time in my life. Some of those relationships now are still at a distance. But relationships are important. And so back to Jacob's comment, we didn't do it by ourselves, Mama. We're not meant to do it by ourselves. We're not intended to do this life alone. Amen. We are not. We are supposed to have a relationship with one another. That's what it's about. Amen. And how do we know that? Because Jesus tells us. In John chapter 13, and most of us uh, recall chapter 13 because we just, not, not too long ago, read a lot of information after, out of John 13. It talks about the Passover, the Last Supper. So a lot of things that happen in John chapter 13 first part of it um, is the Passover meal, the last supper, the pa last supper that Jesus has with his disciples. 
It's the same chapter that Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. The same chapter that Jesus foretells about his betrayal and about Peter denying him. So a lot happens in that chapter. But there's something else that happens in that chapter. And that's in John 13, 34 and 35. And Jesus tells his disciples, he says, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know, that's 35 words in that, those two verses. 35. Out of those 35 words... He says, love one another three times. That's pretty significant. Three times. And the other Gospels don't talk about this little... Com they don't have this commandment in, this, uh, in them. It's only in John. So, I think that's very significant. And I think it's significant that he says it three times. Of course, I told you I was Wonder Woman. And I wonder about everything. I wonder if the three times were significant because Peter, this conversation is happening and right after he says this, he tells Peter that Peter's going to deny him three times before the cock crows. So I wonder if that's significant that he tells them, love one another three times. But, I digress. Chapter over, chapter and a half over, chapter 15 the beginning of this chapter is talking about the vine and the fruit and the, you know, you don't, you got to read it to kind of get all the bearings together. But basically what Jesus is saying is you have to abide in Him to be able to produce fruit. Okay. I get that. Well, in, in verse 12, He says again, My command is this, love each other. As I have loved you. And then in 17, yet again he says, This is my command. Love each other. Hmm. So in just a short time period, from the Passover meal to this point, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, Jesus has told the disciples five times to love each other. Again, pondering and wondering why Jesus felt the, felt the need at this point to express to them the need to love each other. <clears throat> you might think that it was to prepare them for His upcoming crucifixion because they were going to experience mourning. They were going to be afraid for their own lives. There's going to be a lot of things going on in those three days before he rose. And of course the disciples didn't know, couldn't see that. So I wonder if, if, if Jesus was reminding them to love each other because they were going to need each other. Need to each other and need each other's support. And he's emphasizing to them how important... Their connection is how important their relationship, their community. They were in a community with one another. And at this point, Jesus did something. <clears throat> in these four verses that had never been done in the world before. As he had done quite a few things that had never been done before. But he created and identified and set apart a group of people, and identified them by one thing. Love. <clears throat> so for the first time in history, the followers of Christ are being identified by their love for each other. Hmm. Another piece of the puzzle, you might say. The early church even demonstrated the importance of... Uh, of, of loving one another. Because in Acts chapter 2, in 
Jerusalem, people were from everywhere before the day of Pentecost. I mean, they were from all over. And there's like six or eight different countries, some of them I can't even pronounce, that they're from. They're all over, from all over. <coughs> but, and then in, in verse 42, uh, 44 through 45, it says, All believers were together and had everything in common. Let's, let me, I'm going to pull that up. I'm going to look at that because I didn't put that in my notes. <clears throat> I just had a couple of. So let's uh, look at Acts 2, verse 44, y'all, if you've got your Bibles with you. <clears throat> but it talks about how they all lived and communed together, which I think is very important. Because a lot of things happen when we are in relationship with other fellow believers. We grow spiritually. We can't grow spiritually if we're not in fellowship with other believers. <clears throat> so, 2.44. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the, uh, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. And then down in... Um, in the end of verse 40, 46, it says, They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the early church saw the need of community and for loving one another. So, love is important because without love, you can't have community. It won't work. If we don't love one another as Christ loved us, or even love each other, like we love each other, <laughs> and recognize the importance of, of fellowship with His people, we can't grow. We can't grow spiritually. We can't become mature Christians. Community is important. I know for myself it is. I need y'all. I need to be in a body, in a body of uh, Bible-believing Christians for myself so that I grow and I sharpen my skills and I sharpen my knowledge of who, uh, who God is. And where there's love, there's service. <clears throat> Jesus not only cared about the spiritual needs of the people he came in contact with and obviously sacrificially serving for our sacrifice and the lamb for our sins, but he also took care of the physical need. And that's what's important. We've got we've to keep that in mind. The early church would meet the needs of the needy and the downtrodden if there was a need. You know, we make a decision every day whether or not to seek opportunities to be in fellowship with each other or with other believers that need a fellowship. And this means for us that we have to put our own guard down. We have to be willing to, you know, take the mask off and open our own hearts up, get to know people and understand who they are and what's important to them and, and to learn some about their life. What makes them tick? Sometimes we can feel unqualified for a task at hand. Just like that thousand piece puzzle. I know, didn't feel like I was qualified. But then God puts people in our, in our paths and in our, in, in our lives that are fully prepared and willing to help with the task at hand. And just like the folks that helped us put our puzzle together and, and help us complete the puzzle, there are people that will come into our lives and they'll help with guidance and show us things that we may not have seen before. And, th and see things in ways that we may never see. 
may have never seen it but uh, if we had not come in contact with that person. And something that, you know, I have noticed in my own life when we open our heart and we share our experiences and share how God has done things in our life and, and how Jesus has loved us through others and, and brought people into our lives to help us go through uh, a trial or a struggle <clears throat> that it has been hugely encouraging to me when I have a conversation with someone and then I'm like, oh man, that piece that's on the perimeter of my puzzle, it fits right here. I know why that happened now. I know why that situation happened because I can share that with somebody else. I experienced that. I went through that. I can share how God delivered me from that or walked me through that or helped me with that situation or I learned how to pray through that decision. And I know where that puzzle piece fits. And that puzzle piece from our past will fit perfectly in someone else's life. This is a very short sermon because the last thing I, because I want to open it up for discussion and I want us to talk and share what's on our hearts and I purposely made it very con concise because I wanted to have a lot of discussion time but lastly before I open the floor up <clears throat> I just want to tell each one of you as a group how much I love y'all and how important each one of you are to me. And I want us to continue to build our community here at Troy Community so that when folks walk in the door, they just feel and it radiates love. And they, they can feel it <coughs> driving onto the parking lot. And that's what, I, that's what I'm, my prayer is. I want us to have so much love for people in our community right here that they drive by this church and they're like, man, something is going on in there. we got to figure out what's going on in there. And then they come in and they feel a love they've never felt before. And that's my prayer for our church. Amen. Now, I'm done talking, y'all. I said it was short. So, the floor is open. Can I share first? Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm sharing this for, there's a lot of people here that don't know this, but... Some of y'all will remember it and how it's come up all during since we got, we formed this church. When, when it was just like us three and no more, us four and no more. <laughs> uh, I was uh, dreaming and I was, I, I used to do the crossword puzzle all the time and I could not make this crossword puzzle work and I was very frustrated and I woke up and the minute I woke up God said to me, it's not your puzzle to put together. It's my puzzle. And that, mm. that has come up so many times, hasn't it, in this fellowship. You know, wow. other people giving words like that, that it's, it's God's puzzle. And God's doing it, not us. We're not supposed to do it. That God's doing it. And we're supposed to let Him do it and follow His lead. Well, before I do want to share this, as I was driving in this morning, I was listening to... Um, Christian radio, and I don't know the, the pastor, but ironically, it's not ironically, it's God, uh, his sermon was on uh, John 13 as well, love your neighbor or love one another, and talking about community and then the importance of having a community and being in fellowship with a community. And I kind of joked that I had a story behind my flamingo cup. Flamingos are my spirit animal, for those of y'all that may not know. And the reason for that is I'm a very social being, and flamingos are very social animals. You very rarely see one flamingo all by itself. So, anyway, that's my little story. That one by itself. <laughs> it's not real, Lillian. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> it's not, it's got her. <laughs> so... Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say? Alan has shared with me, and I can share this, uh, uh, and Diane will remember this. I don't know who, who else will, but he shared with me how, you know, there's a verse in Timothy that's his life verse, and I know he shared it with lots of y'all. 
But then, then you know, and Timothy is that's his that's his two books of the Bible that that he really loves. He loves them all, but I mean, that's, he focuses on that a lot. But and he was sharing with me the times in his life that God has put Timothy's in his life, and that God had told him that he was going to uh, uh, minister to Timothy's and bring them along, you know, <coughs> young people and, and mentor them. And uh, he was he was praying because he was here, and he was saying, Lord, do I need to go home? Do I need to just go home, quit and go home? What is wrong? You've got to give me a sign. And he said he had made contact with three p people that, that he wanted to come here and help us work. And he said, I've got to know something. And I got, I need, I think he said, I got to know it today. And uh, TJ called him that day. Or came, and did he come on? He came on to see him, didn't he? He was walking out there when TJ called him. And TJ's name is Timothy James. I mean, God's putting it together. Yeah, I have to think about so many times and in here recently where I take a piece of the puzzle and I am determined because it looks like it fits. I'm going to pound that sucker in. And make it. Hey, I, I admit I've done that too. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah, because it looks fine. <laughs> looks you like know. it should fit. Well, it does now. <laughs> but, uh, You've been up there. Exactly. I've been it up. I've cut a part of it off. I've cut part of it off, and it fits perfectly in there a little bit <laughs> um, until the next piece doesn't. Right. And, and uh, you know, so many times. Um, I forget that it's it's not really my life <clears> to <throat> force and to drive it forward. And um, and you know when I when I give it to God, all the pieces they do. I know that sounds cliche, but if they do fall into place, and. Um, it may not look like the way I wanted it to look like, and it may not feel the way I wanted it to feel, but in a lot of ways I know that it's, it's a better and it's, it's, it's what is supposed to be there, and it's the way it's supposed to be. And, um, you know, so I have to, you know, that piece gets popped out, and, and, uh, and I just keep moving forward. Um, so, you know, when you were talking about that, I just want to encourage people because a lot of times we get sometimes fixated on one piece and, and we, we forget that, um, that we're not the ones putting that together. Hey, man, that's a good and, word right that there. We, and, and having community is very helpful because y'all don't know how many times people have just come up to me when I'm thinking about <laughs> something and I've been doing that. And all of a sudden, they'll just start a conversation about it. And I'm looking at them like, okay, God, I hear you. <laughs> you know, and, and that type of thing. Or they'll say one word. I've had kids come up and just, like, drop a word. And then they turn around and walk off. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. You know? So that's all I've got. That's a, that's a good word right there. Mm -hmm. Or even conversely, you think you know what the puzzle piece should look like? And the real piece is right there in front of us. No, it can't be that. Right. It can't be right. that one. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> we think it's supposed to look like something else. Yeah. So we, um, yeah, don't get it for a while. And once we get over the fact of it's not how we wanted it to happen or it doesn't look like we wanted it to, I have never, ever, ever, ever in my life had God do something that I didn't like better than what I had thought I wanted it to, to look like. Amen. Ever. But. In the moment, as I'm going through it, I think I can do it better. <laughs> I think I can fit that puzzle piece back together a little bit better than he can. But if I just let him do it, I have never, ever had a piece of the puzzle fall into my life. And it wasn't better than what I had envisioned. Anybody else? Yes? Um, unrelated to like the puzzle thing. We were reading and you were talking about some of the good things that the early church does. And uh, my mind 
kind of, kind of went to, uh, we, we talk about God being our Father, and um, thankfully, uh, I don't have kids yet. I, I plan to, though. And I hear from parents all the time that they want to teach their kids um, from their experiences, their faults. And I'm really glad that we can look at the Bible, even though our Father in Heaven doesn't make faults. Um, we have things to look at. We have good and bad to learn from. And it's really cool that we serve a God. It's really Amen. To open up. And, mm -hmm. and He's eager to reveal Himself. And while He Himself is perfect, we're not. We can learn from mistakes from others. Mm -hmm. uh, also, by learning from not mistakes, just God revealing Himself and saying good things. It's really cool, you know, we, we as people want to do this for our kids and show them, hey, I did this and I screwed up and it, and it sucks, you shouldn't do it. And we get this idea, or like kids go through this phase. A good friend of mine calls it the rebellious child syndrome. It's really funny. Like they got to go make their own mistakes and learn on their own. Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case. You know, we have scripture, we have text, we have technology to reveal, and we have historians to go back and identify and, and uh, cipher things for us. Absolutely. Really, really cool. And you're right. Uh, James 1 talks about uh, anyone who want, uh, desires wisdom, ask for it because he gives it freely. And he gives it abundantly. So, and that's important. Yes, ma'am. Um, referencing on what he said about mistakes. Um, usually when I make certain mistakes, I'm kind of like, God, you know, like, God, will forgive me for doing this? Because you know sometimes you feel things that you do, you feel like God is angry at you and he's not going to forgive you. So you're sitting like, I shouldn't have done that. Um, or why did I say this? Or why did I think this? Because you know, you get aggravated, you get upset, you say things that you don't really mean. I might go ahead and do something I'm not supposed to do because I'm guilty of that sometimes. Um, well, I want to I want to encourage you right now, honey. There is nothing you can ever do, yeah. ever in this world. Even think the worst possible thing that you can think, because we label sin. God does it. We <laughs> label sin and think this is the worst possible sin. When you make mistakes, they say, "Oh, we don't want to be around her because she did things." Did things. There is nothing you can do that God would not forgive <laughs> you. Amen. And you mean it. You've got to mean it. You've got to repent in your heart of anything you ask Him, even the worst of the worst sins, the things that we think is repulsive and awful. If they, if, if they ask for forgiveness and they have true repentance in their heart, God will forgive them just like that. And He forgets it. And that's, the, that's the beauty about, about God. He forgets it. Yes. Amen. People are like us, though. They're not perfect. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. And, and, and we, we can't always live, do stuff like that. We can't live our lives trying to make people happy. Especially people that are not in a, in a fellowship. If they don't know who Jesus is, they're going to bring up your past. They're going to remind you of all the bad things they did. The bad things you did. Because they don't know who Jesus is and they don't know real love. They only know what the world shows them as love. They don't know a godly love. They're only show, they're only, they only know a worldly love, a worldly view of love, which is completely different than a love that, that Jesus has and our Heavenly Father has for us. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Glad to have y'all here today, by the way. I hope y'all come back. Uh, to speak about what you were saying, to get in your DNA that there's nothing you can do that can increase or decrease God's love for you. Amen. You're not anything. Get that in your knower. And Amen. to also know, know that uh, <coughs> when those kind of thoughts about uh, uh, can I be forgiven of this, start pouring what the Word says about it. So Amen. The, the Word says God, once you repent, God remembers your sin no more as far as the east and the west. Amen. And speak those words over that. Speak life to that. Don't don't believe the lie of the enemy or the bait of the enemy because be honest with you, the enemy uses others. And a lot of times, those are closest right. to you. Amen. Amen. That's a word right there. And Satan is the you know, and it's not, and it's not that person. It's the enemy. Absolutely. So learning to distinguish that. That's right. As you get older and walk in that, you learn mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That is a, that's a good word, and that's tr so true. Because the enemy is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and I used yep. to tell my girls all the time. I tell Jacob too, but Jacob doesn't have the, the intellect yet that my older girls do, but I used to tell them all the time that the enemy attacks people that are walking the walk and walking with Christ. If you're not walking with Christ or you have, are not a Christian, 
He's not worried about you. He's worried about those that are trying to tell others about who Jesus is. Because he knows his he knows what his demise is. He knows that he has lost the war. He just wants to win the little battles That's right. throughout Amen. our life. I had a pastor years ago told me that I had a lot of things happening. And it wasn't a good thing. But he said, Praise God. I thought, huh? Oh, well. Praise him in the storm. That's right. Listen, when you're fixing to have a big breakthrough in your life and you're on the right path, yep. all hell comes against you. It's Absolutely. a sign that you're doing what God wants you to do. You know, I heard Just a, to start praising God. That's right. You're on That's the right a good path. word, too. That is a good word. Amen. I heard a pastor say one time that a thief does not rob an empty safe. That's right. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. You know, a thief is not going to go and rob an empty safe. <clears throat> and that's exactly the same scenario with, with, with Satan. He's not going to bother us if there's not anything magnificent that God's about to do in our lives. He's going he's gonna to attack us when there is something about to be cracked open and about to be birthed in our lives. That's a good word, my friend. Anybody else? Paula, you look like you got something to say. Uh, a couple of things. Yesterday, Barbara and I were taking the camper down to Dothan, and uh, it was supposed to rain, and it didn't. When we got down there, you know, that was nice. But it, we heard a, a, a pastor speaking about uh, fighting against the enemy. And it, what he said was, those who don't fight evil fight statues. Wow. And, and uh, you know, that, how true that is. Mm -hmm. You know, that can be anything especially the Old Testament mm -hmm. and all that, the, all the different things that they made that they would always do against. Uh, the puzzle thing, I, I, it's interesting. Uh, I have a short attention span, so puzzles are hard for me to do because uh, I get frustrated really quick. Hey, that's me too. And I want them to go together. <laughs> and, uh, that's why that one sat on our table for a month and a half. Probably. You know, I, I, I've learned over the last couple of years living in different campgrounds for a while. Uh, there's always the retired people in there doing puzzles. <laughs> like those kind of puzzles you're talking about. And um, it was real exciting, you know, a couple of times Barbara and I, like, when they were leaving, because we didn't want to, you know, be there. We kind of would wash your clothes or something, and we'd put a piece here and there. <laughs> felt, felt good about it, you know. And, <laughs> You felt like, yeah, I can do this and it'll all start to come together. Then nothing comes together and then you start making them fit. <laughs> and, and then you're like, I hope nobody saw that. You know? <laughs> and then they get it fixed. And all of a sudden, the puzzle's done. And there's one or two pieces missing. But you know what? Does it really matter? No. Mm -mm. But you know, it was like, all of a sudden it was like, no, I can't stand those people who do that. They take that one piece out, I think, just on purpose. It's kind of like a sock thing, right? You know, how, how do you, just, even if you buy every sock that looks alike, you still end up with one. An odd number. An odd yes. number, you know? And, 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 I, and it's just going to be that way. Um, that's my life first, John, you know, 34 and 35. And um, for me, love was always taking. What, what, can, what can you do for me? You know, love is making me satisfied, whatever that is. And I'm not perfect by any means. And, but now, love has a totally different word, you know, loving other people uh, unconditionally, mm -hmm. constantly. And there's nothing that feels better. You know, when I get angry at people, it's me, not them that I'm angry, or it's something that happened. You know, do I really, really dislike that person that much, you know, that mm -hmm. they needed to pull in front of me at crystals and just about wreck me? You know, <laughs> I guess they needed a crystal burn. <laughs> you know, it's something that makes sense, you know, all the time. But, you know, it just gives me time to pray for them, and I need practice. And I think that's that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Is those missing pieces and those things in life is I'm not connecting. And I'm not being grateful. And I'm not doing the things that as my life matures I know I I need to do. And when I don't, they don't go together. Mm -hmm. Or it seems that I can create more havoc for myself or put more pressure on myself. 
or I become more introverted, you know, than extrovert, and I isolate from everything. And, you know, a puzzle by itself is isolated from the rest of the puzzle, the piece. And you got to come out of isolation to fit in the puzzle to finish the picture. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's good. That's good. You know, that's good. I, I don't yeah. want to be that. I don't want to live my life as that. Piece that fell under yeah. the table. That, under the car. Under the <laughs> couch. <laughs> <laughs> they got lost. <laughs> Me either, man. And, and whenever that is supposed to fit, it'll fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much for everybody's comments and that message. There. I need. Well, thank you. It. I appreciate that. You guys, thanks for coming and serving the servants. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what's important. Well, I, I like you, you know, you're talking about your experience and what your love experience was growing up. Mine was, I felt conditional love by people around me. I didn't, I didn't experience unconditional love until much later in my life. I always, it seemed like I was loved if my grades were okay, if I did this, if I did that, but if that wasn't done, then I was... My name was worse than mud, <laughs> and I, was, I didn't feel there was no love at all, my friend, I can tell you that. But it was after I really understood agape love, and that goes back to Quinetta's comment, understanding a godly love, and understanding what that feels like, and, understand, and feeling that versus the world's view of love. That was a good share, thank you. Anybody else? It's not a little thing, Miss Diane. Come on. It just occurred to me when you were talking or reading that sometimes we're blessed to be the one to give, and sometimes we have to humble ourselves. That's right. When we can be a, a blessing to somebody else to help us. Amen. 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 That's the Amen. Right and, and I'm going to be honest with you, standing up here on videotape, that's the hardest part for me, is to humble myself to allow others to, to get a blessing by blessing me. That's, right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hardest thing for me to do. I want to tell this, since it involves you. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Let's turn this video down. <laughs> so, so Ryan has needed a little bit of help in different things, different things. So when it, and I've, I've got my rotator cuff, it, this one's got five pairs and this one's got, I don't know, and you know, it's just a mess. It's hard for me to go to the grocery store. I can't lift my arms up. I can lift my arms up, but I suffer for it. So when Saran has helped me go to the grocery store, it was hard for me to accept that, wasn't it? It was really hard that I had to have somebody to pick up stuff for me. You know, and, it and then I would have to yell at her, don't pick up that milk, what am I here for? And I, and I said, are you sure this is hard? Are you sure you can do this? Because I felt so bad that I was having to ask somebody to help me. And that, that's the truth. And I think most of us are like that. That is the hard part of love, is allowing others to love us. That's right. When we... When we need that, you know, that extra service, or we need something, I don't think any of us are. But now I love, I love doing stuff for Saran and Jacob. I love it, but I don't love it when I have to have somebody help me. It's That's crazy. That's part of your love language, mm -hmm. doing for us. I That's know right. it is, but then and when I them do for you, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I tell people when they tell me something like that? What? Hush, you're not robbing me of my blessing. Hey, no, right. That's the truth. I told That's so. the truth. That's absolutely That's the truth. People have done for me so much in my life. Yeah. yeah. You, you let people, if you let people minister to you, then they get a blessing. Well, and that's what, you, you, you're right. Because if God's told you to do something, you're going to be blessed doing Amen. it. Amen. And you don't want, you don't want somebody refusing it and rejecting your blessing and blocking your blessing. But that's so true. And I've had to, I found myself saying that at different times recently. Yeah, I'll let you bless me. <laughs> and, then, and then ask God to forgive me for being, being unruly. <laughs> yeah, what's the hardest word in the world to say is thank you. Uh, yeah. You just say thank you and walk away. The other thing yeah, I, I, I just wanted to throw back is it stinks when you're, you know, 
in trials and tribulations. And it stage. does, buddy. But <laughs> oh, I'm working on a sermon for that too, by the way, because <laughs> I'm da I'm dealing with one right now. <laughs> but the biggest, the biggest thing is if I get my head around it, and I can be used to, for somebody else. Yes. I will walk out in front of the car for you know some little kid to learn a lesson, not not to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's all worth it. It sucks, but it's all worth it. And that's maybe right. that's maybe that's what God has for me. Maybe Isn't I it? have to be that you know Job thing or whatever that is. Maybe not. You know, maybe it's a Timothy thing or a Paul thing or whatever, whatever. But that's okay too. You know. And then in, in James too, that it says, "Count all tr struggles pure joy." In that, in that James one, somewhere. Yeah, that's all. You think I'm it's? Sure, I'm sure Father wants us to ask him in every tribulation we have. Father, where is the opportunity? Amen. Amen. That is a good word. Where is the opportunity? Where can I bless? Yeah. Your, you what and. Is it you want from me in this situation? That's a good. That is good. One of the things too, I think, that gets me out of my own head is, I love it when people bring negative things to me. Because I try really hard to find something good about it. You know, when, when those family issues are happening or physical, emotional, whatever, financial, you're like, how, how can you look at it like that? Because what a blessing that is to someone else. Now, I have a hard time with it when I'm in it, you know. But, you know, that helps you get out of yourself. You know, yep. I think that's what it is. The community comes when you get rid of self. That's right. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Do you like looking at your puzzle pieces and seeing where God has brought you so far in your life? Oh, yes. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. That's your story. Absolutely. And, and I, you can see every bit of it from the beginning and it continues where, to where it day. is now. And, and there's no end until there's no end. I'm telling you, it was. I, I wish I could have truly given you the graphic of how it looked. And maybe one day I'll learn how to edit on Adobe and I can do that, y'all. But I don't, I don't know how to do that just yet. Actually, but. we can all visualize it. <laughs> but, I mean, I could so see... Like the puzzle pieces just falling mm -hmm. from a voided space onto a huge canvas. and But you're right. When you see those puzzle pieces and how God used someone in your life and then that situation they helped you with, you know, a year, two years, or maybe two days later, you were able to use that knowledge what you with, somebody else. with someone else and put a piece in their puzzle. So... I mean, it was, it's really incredible, and it's, you're right, seeing how the pieces fall into place and how it looks. Anything else? I appreciate this. Y'all, this was a great share today. I mean, I'm glad that I, I'm glad I cut my time to a limited, because I wanted to make sure we had plenty of share time today. Do your flamingos have names? No. I'm not, I ain't, I, I ain't that, I ain't, I ain't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love flamingos. And Jacob will he'll tell you every every time. Oh, there's a flamingo. He wants to buy me every flamingo. Have you ever petted one and fed one? Ah, uh, yes. Well, at the zoo. Yeah. My, yeah, we yeah, did. yeah. Yeah. And they'll put their heads on. Mm -hmm. them and oh, on. I didn't know that. Oh, I love them. I love flamingos. If I could have a pet flamingo, I probably would, because <laughs> I think they're amazing. But I couldn't just have one. I would have to have a, like three or four because they are community animals. Mm -hmm. And then that would just be a problem. So, I just admire them from afar. Do they make for life? Uh, I think they do. I don't know. I haven't done that much research. Though. You know, swans do. Yeah. I think th no, I think they are uh, made for life. Kathy, do you know that? No. <laughs> made for life. <laughs> yeah, we could Google it. Kelly might know. Well, uh, Jeff, would you mind dismissing us, my friend?